A quick note to our listeners, we recorded this episode in early February, and as you can imagine, a few things have changed since then. The information is still very relevant, but we wanted to make sure that no one was confused by a few of our guest comments. So just a heads up, let's get to it. Oh, and one more thing. When I introduced Erin Duncan of SIA, I got her title wrong. Her correct title is the VP of Congressional Affairs. So now let's get to the show. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Solar Tech Talk. I'm Aaron Bingham and I'm here with Kate Collardson. We're both product managers over at Baywa RE Solar Systems. We're here to geek out about solar energy. Kate, how's it going? What's going on? It's going well. I watched a movie recently. It's on Netflix. It's called Kiss the Ground. Hmm. Uh, and while it's not solar related, I wanted to, to take a minute to talk about it because I left the movie feeling very hopeful. And that's something that when we I think about climate change in general and the, the problem before us and what we need to tackle, I often feel overwhelmed and discouraged. But this uh, movie is about um, regenerative of farming practices and how that can be used for carbon sequestration, which is a key for us to maintain the habitability of the planet that we're living on right now. And so I uh, I would encourage everyone to, to go out and watch Kiss the Ground on Netflix, and it, it'll make you feel better, I think. And might help save the planet, sounds like. <laughs> That sounds really interesting. I'll, I'll have to check it out. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but you know, I these days I think we could all use a little bit of hope. So I'll be excited to check it out and let you know what I think. On the solar topic, though, are there are there any articles or anything that you've read that you're really interested in and want to give a plug to here? An article that I read recently, uh, it came out at the beginning of last month on Green Tech Media. It's 10 uh, solar and storage trends for 2021. It's written by Barry Cinnamon, who- Yay, Barry. Yay, Barry. (laughs) He has a great ability to uh, say a lot uh, concisely. And one thing that that jumped out at me that is uh, number one on this list is the- all roof orientations are fair game for solar. And that means that um, we are going to, to start seeing more and more PV being placed at orientations that we used to avoid uh, because so, they so were- we're talking north facing orient- orientations and- <laughs> Yes, which wow. is amazing. But uh, the economics work out. We have some, some systems here in Colorado that I drive by with some frequency that have modules facing north and it, I, it's always been a a head scratcher for me. Um, (laughs) But this article kind of puts it into perspective and and the economics makes sense at this point in in some cases to go ahead and put those modules facing north. So um, I recommend that everyone look for this article on Green Tech Media, 10 Solar and Storage Trends for 2021. What about you, Aaron? Do you have any articles that you've read that you want to tell us about? Absolutely. There's a great spot in the Los Angeles Times called Joe Biden Wants 100% Clean Energy. Will California show that it's possible? It's written by one of their staff writers, Sammy Roth, and he does a really excellent job of outlining not only the labyrinth of interests that are factoring into the decisions that get made within California about how we move forward um, on a grand scale, meeting our renewable energy um, portfolio standards, but also how some of the decisions made within certain regulatory bodies, <laughs> California CPUC, are, are not necessarily going to support our state's objective of achieving our clean energy goals. So it was really interesting to read, and I, I definitely appreciated Sammy's uh, approach to laying out how these interests are at times competing and driving our energy infrastructure in a direction that's not really in line with achieving our renewable energy goals. There's a lot to um, to weigh there uh, from the perspective of, uh, you know, the utilities and the, the PUC. And you and I are on the same page that uh, moving to, to clean energy is, is important. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's important that we all understand how the bodies that regulate decisions that are being made within our own individual states can have a huge impact on our ability to achieve our long-term goals and moving in that direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that, um, speaking of 
Joe Biden and what's happening on the national stage. We had a chance to catch up with Erin Duncan, who's the VP of Federal Affairs for SIA. And she got to tell us more about uh, what SIA is seeing at uh, on the national level. So let's bounce over and chat with Erin. Thanks so much for being here, Erin. Hi, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. To jump right into it, we have a new administration, which uh, means new policies. And um, right off the bat, can you tell us, has, has anything changed so far since the inauguration? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, it's been a really exciting, I guess we're going on three months now since the um, election and uh, the transition team working to pull together policies um, that the Biden team is really aggressively seeking to implement. Um, First, we saw a ton of really qualified, awesome people nominated for cabinet positions, and then sort of the layers below the cabinet nominee, um, again, coming from really diverse, interesting, smart um, places in nonprofits and trade associations. And those people are slowly getting put in place. You know, it seems like, at least to me, given how aggressive the Biden team has been on executive orders and just setting a tone and an agenda, they've had to get right to work because of all the crises facing our country. Um, So it feels longer than the like two weeks that it's been (laughs) uh, since the inauguration. So it feels longer than that. But these people are still like finding their way around and getting seated and getting started. And um, the Senate is getting the nominees moving through the process. So I think the things that we've changed is like the tone from the top, right? Like we always say every company, every, the government starts with the tone from the top. And I think we've seen some really strong executive orders. We've seen commitment toward bipartisanship, um, seeking bipartisan agreement and, you know, professionalism and science. You know, I'm excited for what's to come, but they sure have their um, work cut out for them. So of of the appointments that have been made so far, are there any appointments that your you or SIA are particularly excited about? And can you say a little bit more about what some of those appointments say about this administration's objectives and priorities? We worked at SIA to do outreach to the transition team from the very beginning. I mean, I spent Thanksgiving and up till Christmas having meetings with um, many of the volunteers, really senior people who were staffing up the transition. And then we had a few brief conversations with folks who ended up being nominated. And if there is anything that sticks out, I mean, this is such a sea change as we think about, like, what does it mean to have Deb Holland nominated to be Secretary of Interior? And, you know, just as an American, like, what opportunities does that represent? When you think about um, Jennifer Granholm from such a diverse state of Michigan, nominated um, for Secretary of Energy, the expertise she brings to making agreements across really um, disparate interests. Those are just two that come to mind. But, you know, Michael Regan had his first hearing to be EPA administrator earlier this week. He's someone Sia had speak at our board meeting last October um, when he was still in North Carolina. So, I mean, that's just a couple of examples. I, I could go on, but I think the themes around equity, diversity, respect, thinking about being creative about using federal resources. Those are the kinds of conversations that we've been having uh, with the transition team. And because remember, they didn't know till January 5th that they would have like the very slimmest possible margin in the Senate. So this whole thing depends on the ability to bring people together. And I honestly think, and in my experience, the last two years in this industry has been that solar is one of those issues that can bring people from really disparate backgrounds to the same table because we bring jobs, we bring economic development, we represent, you know, 75% of solar industry businesses are small businesses, as well as, you know, the big companies that uh, keep the machines moving. So I think it's a really, really exciting time to be in the solar industry. And I think that um, the nominees and the tone that the, the Biden team has set from the very beginning is just so hopeful for all of us. Great. Uh, can you tell us about anything that that you know of that's being negotiated right now as far as policy goes? In our space, there's a lot of conversation um, going on around the future of sort of tax policy. We're 
right in there on that one. As you know, uh, the two-year extension that we were able to secure at the end of last year was so great and long overdue. There's a fist bump, a uh, fist pump. Um, <laughs> we are super excited about that and it buys us some time, but I think what we really need as an industry is long-term business certainty. And so there's a couple of different, there's actually a lot of different ways that Congress may decide to move. Um, just this week, we've seen the reintroduction of the Green Act, which is um, kind of the marquee education tax bill um, from the House Ways and Means Committee. And then you know, there are ongoing conversations with the brand new Senate finance chair, Ron Wyden from Oregon. Um, he has a proposal to create a tech neutral credit that would allow a choice between a 30% ITC or PTC for carbon free energy generation, which of course is solar and other things too. So, you know, that that's going to be a longer term process to work out what gets legs and when. And then of course, there's always in the background conversations that we've been engaged in around carbon tax or some other mechanism that would really help drive clean energy transition. So, in terms of actual negotiations for the immediate term, I will say Senate and the Biden administration, I mean, they can do lots of things at the same time, but you may have be aware they're in the middle of negotiating a $1.9 trillion COVID relief package because so many people continue to be hurting from the pandemic. And that is job number one for the president. But they're also continuing to pull the pieces together for um, the next package, which we anticipate to be a very aggressive, broad stimulus proposal. And the president said on the campaign trail and continues to say, you know, the theme around making smart investments in the American economy, you know, naturally leads to making smart investments investments in clean energy. That's where the future of jobs are. Um, but we have to be really strategic about how we pull those policies together. We have to do a lot more work in investing in workforce development and in transmission and easing interconnection delays and, you know, up and down the um, government. So it's a lot of work, but I think They've got a really big vision to, to move it forward. And, you know, we're going to do our part to make sure solar lands in a great place. Yeah, we, we certainly really admire the work that SIA does on the whole to advocate for renewable energy and solar in particular within all of our legislative bodies. Right. And I guess the executive branch as well. You guys are you guys are lobbying, lobbying everybody. Yeah, the whole you... regulatory team. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But we had a, a question in here about what are, what's your outlook for the um, tariffs that were implemented by the Trump administration, and how do you how do you see the Biden administration kind of handling those tariffs going forward? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's something that we at SIA are working really aggressively on. We have a whole dedicated um, trade team that I help support on that regard. Our vice president. Uh, our general counsel and vice president of market strategy, John Smirnow, is one of the national experts in the trade space. And so we're so lucky to have him leading our work there. One of the things I will say, I guess it's February 5th now, um, we don't yet have a trade ambassador, right? So um, Catherine Tai has been nominated. She is currently a staffer, a very senior staffer on the House Ways and Means Committee. What we've pretty much heard pretty consistently is that there is a desire to wait for major decisions around tariffs and other things until she gets in her seat. You know, some of her senior staff are leaving their current jobs, you know, as we speak and haven't yet started. Like I know their general counsel hasn't yet started. So I think some of it is a delay of, of staffing up. And then, uh, but we continue to press our case very, very aggressively. We're not waiting for her to get in the chair, but it, it is a little hard when there's not the people in the chair yet. So we're really looking forward to her confirmation and we continue to outreach to our friends in the Senate in particular to outreach to the White House to make our case as to why, you know, we we need them to listen to what the industry needs. Um, we can support and we do support building out additional U.S.-based manufacturing capacity, and that's going to create jobs also um, in the solar space. And it's something we have um, done a lot of work on. Like I mentioned John before, he's done a uh, manufacturing white paper. We have a manufacturing division at SIA. Um, we're talking about like how we create tax structures to support US-based manufacturing. But in the interim, we don't have the capacity here. And so if you want to build solar at the rate we have to build it, it's going to have to come you know, from imports and, and uh, we could use some relief there. 
I want to jump back real quick and ask if you can, uh, there were a few letters that you threw in and I, are, are you able to explain the difference between ITC and PTC in case any of our, our listeners don't know? Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you for calling me on that because in federal affairs, we sometimes let the acronyms uh, confuse people and it shouldn't. The solar industry has an investment tax credit, that's the ITC. And that's what's really promoted and pushed our industry um, to the um, levels that it is now. The ITC is a tax deduction. Um, right now it's at 26% of the um, capital invested at the end of the project's first year of operation. So it's, it's a at made at the beginning of an investment. The PTC is a production tax credit, and that is an annual tax deduction for each kilowatt hour of the project's production during the first 10 years. So it has a 10-year tail. So, you know, wind and solar projects are, you know, they're just different animals and our industries use different types of technology, but that is the difference. And right now, solar doesn't have access to a production tax credit. Um, so those are some of the proposals that are out there. That's great. So, so basically, the, the proposal is that solar projects could potentially choose between inv an investment tax credit or, or a production tax credit. In the tech neutral draft that we anticipate Senator Wyden offering. Yeah. Great. Thanks for explaining that. Do, um, do you think that that would have a big impact on the way that uh, finance systems and, and finance deals are structured? I would imagine that, you know, a lot of those financing structures rely on the ITC. Is that something that if, if folks were given a choice would lend itself more towards, you know, say system owners choosing to own their system as opposed to leasing it or doing some sort of uh, other structured financing to, to pay the upfront costs? You know, I think it, it depends on every project's math, but it also depends on where the project is built. There are some parts of the country where very sunny parts of the country where, you know, maybe a developer would choose to go a different way. But you're right, like the solar has built this whole structure around the ITC and certainly preservation of the investment tax credit is, you know, job one for my team. Mm -hmm. Senator Wyden is trying to just create a proposal that is that would apply to a lot of different technologies so that we wouldn't be necessarily siloed. And so that's why at least the drafts that he's introduced in prior Congresses has offered those choices. So are there any other incentives other than tax credits that are being proposed or worked on um, at the federal level? There is a lot of conversation around a clean energy standard or a renewable fuel standard, which is a little bit different than an, you know, a tax incentive, but certainly would drive business. And uh, we don't currently have federal standards for either. So part of the question is how that gets accomplished, given the current politics. And if everything has to go through a budget reconciliation process, which means it kind of has to fit in a fiscal box and would need to move with every Democrat on board or a bipartisan agreement to get 51 votes. There's some question as to how an RFS or a CES could fit in that fiscal box, but those are several, um, actually many, many different versions of CES, for example, that were introduced over the last several Congresses and that we anticipate coming this Congress. Um, that is a policy proposal that has developed a lot of attention over the last several years. So I would anticipate um, seeing more of that. Again, the question is always, does it get across the finish line? You know, you can introduce anything you want. And then building the coalition to get something across the finish line in this environment is, that's the magic, that's the magic bean. <laughs> that's the challenge. That's what we're all here for, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, you know, the Biden administration announced their Build Back Better program as a, as a part of, uh, you know, one of their top priorities for their first mm -hmm. few months, years in office. And I'm, I'm wondering, how does the Build Back Better uh, platform, as it's been described so far, promote renewable energy businesses and installations? Yeah, I mean, I think the president and his team on the campaign trail were very clear about how central they felt the energy transition, you know, our companies, renewable energy companies, they provide solutions for so many problems that our country faces, right? We can create very short order. We create high paying, a great, you know, career path type jobs, um, which is so critical 
um, and that our country needs more of. We also address climate change, right? And that is a central concern of the um, coalition that helped to elect the president and something I think the president himself is deeply invested in. The, the piece I would point out that two pieces that are sort of inherent in every piece of this Build Back Better proposal, which is the focus around equity in jobs, high quality, family supporting, well-paying jobs to create more economic um, opportunity and equity for people across the country. And I think that's something solar can provide as well as addressing environmental justice and making sure that communities that have been left behind or who have suffered from other types of energy generation are central to the plans moving forward. And so one of the exciting things that that I have seen um, and that we at CIA I think are really well positioned for is how our technology and how our businesses can um, address a host of issues, right? Like uh, with aggressive recruiting, with job training programs, with, you know, solar, unlike some other technologies, we can build it anywhere. Community solar that brings, you know, energy security and clean energy to communities where asthma rates are terribly high. And, you know, maybe that's because of a, a plant that is emitting, you know, dangerous chemicals. So labor unions in particular were critically important to the president's success and successful election. And I think we're going to see a lot of requirements on our industry from, from that side of the fence also. So it's kind of like how you balance. We want to continue to grow, but also like they have to be high quality jobs, which we have an answer for, and we are creating every day. And then they also have to address environmental justice and opportunity for all. And I think solar has a great answer for that as well. Yeah, I've, I've been really excited about the, the emphasis on environmental justice and, and finding ways to, you know, enable those communities that are on the front lines of um, energy production and have, you know, borne the weight of the externalities associated with energy production, you know, as it's in, in, the, in the forms that it's taken, coal, natural gas, fracking, all of those things, they all have externalities or unaccounted for costs associated with them. And those costs are often borne out by the communities in which those particular resources are either extracted or refined or, you know, shipped, whatever the case may be. I know here in the Bay Area uh, had some, had quite a bit of debate around shipping coal into or out of the Port of Oakland, for example. And even just having those, those open top trains full of coal ash go by, by train to whatever ref refining facility or production facility they're heading to means that, that that fine particulate matter is getting into the air and causing higher rates of asthma in some of those uh, those communities through which those trains are, are traveling. And, and to date, there really hasn't been a concentrated focus on how do we how do we try to make that right? How do we try to make sure that those communities are not left mm -hmm. behind when you know, we have this great opportunity to allow distributed generation in the form of rooftop solar propagate throughout mm -hmm. our communities and, and our country. I'm, okay. I'm right there with you. And also, how do you make rooftop solar more accessible to more communities? I think that is a really important piece as well. Um, right now, the only tools we have are through these tax credits. And if you don't have a very big tax burden, it's hard to justify the investment. Um, so we're also looking at additional ways to make distributed generation solar um, more accessible to more families. Um, and that may take um, a number of different, there's, there's a number of ways to get there is what I want to say. But sure. I think that's a really important piece to think about. I think the other really unique piece that the Bidens have really leaned into recently that is so important and I think solar has to be aware of as we advocate for our industry is something that one of the senators this week in one of the hearings called energy veterans, people who traditionally made their livelihoods building our country, right, based on the fuel available at the time, and how we as clean energy companies work to address the needs of those communities and those workers, and what does that look like, and how can we create space to bring them into the clean energy fold or be supportive of plans that may come forward to help them retrain into some other career field. So I think it, it, they're really approaching it for a really holistic, generous perspective, you know, because we do owe those communities a lot. And those people worked really hard. And so how we respect that and uh, create policies that take everything into consideration is really important. So yeah, absolutely critical. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's, there's a focus on that. Um, because it's one thing for, for us to, to promote 
these new uh, energy sources. But but like you said, we, we, we can't leave the folks who've been producing energy for all our lives, uh, can't leave them behind. Um, they, but retraining is, uh, is going to be critical. Is there, is there anything else uh, that you're particularly excited about that you want to share with us about that mm-hmm. SIA is, is working on? There's just so many issues in the solar industry space these days. Everything from making sure our supply chain is free of forced labor um, overseas, uh, which SIA has taken a really strong stand against. Uh, we released a letter uh, yesterday of 175 companies committing to you know, forced labor in their supply chain to helping lead our companies toward how to hire more diverse solar employees and develop a workforce that reflects the values of our industry, which are inclusive and positive and making sure that our companies uh, have the tools that they need to create that environment in their own space. And then, you know, everything in between, like, I'm really, this is going to sound like a total nerd, but hello, that's my job. But I'm super excited about working on a giant infrastructure package. Like they, they, the house moved one last July it's a monster, but there's some great stuff in there. You know, we have so many opportunities now. Like what if we had a program that put the opportunity to put solar on every public school in this country? What if we had um, program dollars for, you know, why can't we put solar on firehouses and um, other community centers? Thinking about like the EV revolution that's in the middle of happening, you know, our industry is going to have a huge role to play in charging those cars. And our industry touches every piece of sort of America now, but America 10 years from now, we're going to look back and say, you know, we were babies. Like, look at all we have built and the diversity of the types of businesses in this space, both the diversity of humans that are working there and also like the diversity of like stuff that that um, our companies are making and installing it's, it's incredibly exciting. I'm excited about all of it. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> um, there's a lot happening and the next two years are going to be really intense. Um, and I think there are such interesting characters um, on the Hill from such diverse states who will be making decisions. And that's what really is exciting to me is like learning how to address their concerns. We live in a really complicated country and Everybody wants jobs in their state and everybody wants to see the employment rate go up and everybody wants moms and dads to be able to go to work in the morning and bring home enough money to support their families. And so do we. And so how do we all work together, let alone to save the planet for our kids? I think it's it's a small goal, baby goal, but it's a tremendous uh, moment for our country. So Aaron, are there any other programs or any other events happening that C is sponsoring or hosting that you're excited about and you'd like to plug for our audience? Any, any calls to action for them if they'd like to get involved? We are in the middle of our webinar series on the first 100 days solar vision. We're doing webinars every Friday. We just had one this afternoon on trade and um, what's happening in China. So I would encourage your listeners to log into our website and sign up to listen in on those webinars. I listen to them every Friday and I always come away with more information and more knowledge. We are engaging a lot of different voices in those webinars and it's pretty exciting. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. This was a, a really informative conversation and yeah, we, we appreciate you you being here with us today. Thanks for having me and uh, see you down the road, hopefully in person soon at SPI. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Great. Come on, vaccines. Interesting to hear about the potential for a, a production tax credit as opposed to an investment tax credit. I thought that's, that's an interesting development for the potentially for our industry. Yeah, it's it's really nice to to be going from let's talk about just removing all renewable energy incentives altogether as soon as possible to which renewable energy incentives do we want to use to support the development of this industry? It's a breath um, of fresh air. Yeah, it, it very much feels like we're rowing in the right direction again. So I, I think that to give our listeners a better idea of, of how some of these discussions are happening at the ground level, we should take a look at what's happening in my home state, California. We've got some really interesting regulatory discussions happening around NEM 3.0, Net uh, Energy Metering 3.0 which is the policy that defines how the CPUC is going to be treating 
energy that's generated by renewable energy sources and specifically distributed renewable energy sources. So those renewable energy sources that are behind the meter systems that are installed on homes and on businesses throughout California would be affected by some of the changes that are being discussed by the California CPUC as they're looking at updating the net energy metering uh, rules and guidelines that fall under the CPUC banner have to follow. Yeah, that's a it's that's an important topic. I mean, net net metering has really driven our industry up to this point um, for years, and uh, changes there could could have a big effect on yeah. solar sales. Yeah, you know, we we actually have a couple of examples that we'll go into a little bit more detail in a few minutes with Carter on, but um, you know, one example that we have of a of a change to net energy metering affecting a solar energy market happened in Hawaii a few years back. The Hawaii Utilities Commission decided that they were going to limit the amount of power that any new renewable energy system that was installed on their grid could export and limit it to zero, right? They implemented rules called zero export, which meant that anybody who was interested in having a PV system or some other sort of renewable energy system installed in their home had to figure out a way to ensure that they were going to be consuming all of that power on the spot. And this had a couple of significant impacts on the Hawaii installation market, right? That's not what is on the table in California necessarily to, to move to zero export, but I, I, it does sound like the implications could be similar. The, what's, what's on the table uh, in front of the PUC right now, it could do a lot of damage to the solar industry in the state. Absolutely. And as many of our listeners will know, California's one of the most populous states in the country, if not the most populous state in the country. And we have the most active PV installation market in the country as well. So in, in other cases where we saw significant changes to the Public Utility Commission's regulations and rules around PV installations, like we saw in Hawaii, like we saw in Nevada, which is another example we'll talk about with Carter in a few minutes. In, in those cases, Many of the, the folks who specialized in PV installation were able to, you know, look to other states, find jobs elsewhere, dial their business down, or really refocus on those fringe cases that um, still made sense within the new uh, limited guidelines that the Public Utility Commission in either case had, had imposed. In Nevada's case, it, it was interesting because um, one of the most controversial things that they did was they made it so that anybody who had previously installed a PV system under the guidelines that existed at that time were not grandfathered in. So anyone who had a PV system that was installed and perhaps financed with, with certain cash flow expectations... Uh, they found that their system was no longer delivering the value that they were initially sold on. It created a huge black eye for our industry, for installers and uh, solar energy businesses within each of those states, but in particular in Nevada, where they didn't grandfather those, those existing installations in. Customers felt like they had been betrayed, and, and um, in a very real sense, they had. The Nevada PUC you know, certainly let those customers down. And they and the, the story actually has a positive ending. Um, there's actually a, a great documentary that was produced by one of the one of the fellows from the Property Brothers series. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that series, Kate. Um, so the documentary is called Power Trip and it recently aired on PBS. And it, it kind of talks through the changes that Nevada made to their net metering programs and the impacts that those, ha those changes had on Nevada customers and the subsequent kind of feedback and the subsequent backlash that resulted from those changes being implemented without really considering what the impacts were going to be for folks all over the state who had decided to invest in clean and renewable energy for their home and for their businesses. Yeah, I remember it just felt like they were going after our industry at the time. Uh, that they're, they're just trying to destroy it. And it, <laughs> they did for a little bit. It, it definitely had the effect they were going for. Yeah, and if, if we saw those kinds of changes happen in California, um, you know, the, the Nevada market and even the Hawaii market by comparison to the California market are relatively small. So, you know, we'd, we'd see really, really significant impacts 
nationwide in terms of our ability to to meet our goals as a nation um, to to invest in more clean and renewable energy sources and deploy them everywhere that we can. Well, let's jump over to that chat with Carter. Yeah, let's let's see what's going on with Neem 3.0. We're here today with Carter Lavin. Uh, he is going to tell us a little more about what's going on at the California PUC regarding NEM3. Uh, thanks so much for being here, Carter. Thanks for having me on the show. It's really exciting. We're excited that you're here. First off, uh, before we jump into what's happening, for our viewers who may not be familiar with uh, our solar acronyms, can you explain what NEM is? Sure. Uh, yeah, there's three big acronyms right now. I'll explain them. Um, so there is uh, NEM, which is net energy metering. This is just the fundamental right of sending your power back to the grid. You know, it's daytime, it's a Super Bowl, you're, but you're out, you're about, um, you're sending power back, you get credited at something that is net metering. Um, that that is decided by your state's PUC, which is the Public Utility Commission. So in California, we have the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission, uh, is deciding whether or not that gets to live or die. Um, and we have CALSA, the California Solar and Storage Association, where I work. Uh, we are the ones defending that against a, a whole other sort of uh, acronyms as well. So how has NEM3 come up recently and what should everybody be aware of as they're out there um, both advocating for solar locally, but then also kind of on, mm -hmm. on a statewide scale, what, we, what should we be asking for? Sure. So here in California, there's three main utilities. There's PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric. They are all now in the process of um, basically filing for changes to net metering under the uh, proceeding. Basically, net metering is on trial in California. And in California right now, when you send your power back to the grid, you or your customers get credited at basically retail rate minus a couple of cents for various other acronyms. What the utilities are trying to do is change it so that you get credited at about wholesale rate, maybe plus a penny or two. So that is about a 20 cent difference of the amount of energy of the value from what you're sending back to the grid from like what is the case now and what the utilities are trying to pull. And so this is a gigantic fight that is basically going live now. It will be decided in November with the kind of gavel coming down, here's the decision implemented in 2022 and beyond. And it's basically saying like, look, uh, should solar projects be valued at more or less what they are now, or should they be valued at a fifth of what they're valued now, or even less? And that's, that's what's at stake here in California right now. It seems like they're, um, that, could, that would have a huge financial impact on projects. And, and what, what implications do you foresee if that were to go through? Mm -hmm. Well, and you all and many of your listeners and watchers were probably around in 2016 and saw what happened in Hawaii and Nevada and Arizona and other states where net metering was taken away or drastically changed. Even within California, we have a lot of municipal utilities, uh, munis, uh, that have switched from net metering to net billing or other things. Um, Imperial Irrigation District is a pretty classic one, and there's a lot of smaller ones. And basically, when that happens, no new solar gets installed, or almost no new solar gets installed. Um, and there's you know people who might fiddle something around the edges and like, oh, the perfect customer gets the perfect project and they'll do one. Uh, it's like, okay, that might be you might be feel good to be the person who does that one project that gets its all that entire utility territory but we're, but we're talking fairly i don't want to say catastrophic levels of drop off but this is a pretty gigantic threat to this industry and so we at the california solar and storage association have been working to provide the data to the utility commission to let them know what they're talking about like what's going on to kind of counteract a lot of these false narratives from utilities as well as starting to mobilize a lot of you know, solar companies and great distributors like Baywa, as well as all of your contractors and vendors, because people need to speak up and people need to be heard saying, hey, this is my job. This is my livelihood. This is a global pandemic and an economic recession. And we're doing all these things. And one, you know, solar is great value to the grid. Local solar is a wonderful thing. And two, don't make massive changes to the solar economy during this period of great uncertainty. And so there's petitions we need folks signing. I'm going to talk more about that. And there's a lot of other ways to get more involved. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, for those of you who remember 2016, that's all happening all over again. But this time is, uh, you know, this is kind of like the final round on that. 
and in the biggest solar market in the country to date, right? As a membership director for the California Solar and Storage Association, I, I, uh, I'm not as informed as other states as I, as I should be, as I used to be when I lived in other states and worked with the Maryland, D.C., Virginia, SIA. But there is very much a kind of domino effect because if the utilities can pull it off here, where this is our, this isn't the last stand, but this is the best chance that we as a solar industry have to stop it. You know, CALSA has over nearly 600 members. We represent 75,000 folks. The solar industry in California is a very large industry. And if we mobilize and we get people activated and people donate and people join CALSA and people sign the petitions and activate their customers, you know, we can win this. And if people don't step up and fight here, you know, it's going to be a lot harder for smaller states with smaller markets that have less well-organized folks to come in. And it's going to be, you know, this is, this is the main wall. And if we can hang, if we could hold on to this, uh, it's going to make it a lot easier to defend net metering in other states where this, this issue might be happening, if not this year, maybe a few years from now. Uh, but if California falls, you know, if that market falls, that's a lot of catastrophe for a lot of other folks as well. Would you mind telling us a little bit more of the backstory about how this conversation was prompted at, at mm-hmm. the legislative level? And um, what what are the kind of facts and evidence that our legislators are looking to right now to make the decision? And, and what can we do to provide them with um, a counter narrative that allows them to mm-hmm. um, support our industry? Sure. And so the kind of the main facts on the ground is at the the California Public Utility Commission, which is regulators who are appointed by the governor, they are evaluating whether or not net metering, who does it benefit, who does it not benefit. Um, so to, just to clarify a thing, it's at a, this regulatory body that's governed by the, uh, the governor. It's not done by the legislature, um, which is Ah. changes the contours of this fight a little bit, um, sure. but just want to flag that. But so the regulators basically say, like, look, I, I live in Oakland. I don't have a roof that I can put solar on because I'm in an apartment building. If my neighbor goes solar, did they help me or did they hurt me? That That is the fundamental question. And the answer is they help me. They make my life so much easier because that's a lot less congestion on the grid. I can't do this, but they did. And so that means PG&E doesn't have to jack up my rates to pay for some infrastructure improvement because that already got taken care of. You know, it's like saying if you, if I have to drive to work every single day, no matter what, and you and Kate start carpooling, is my life better or worse? It's like, it's so much better. Even if I'm never in the carpool lane, my life is made better. And so that's the kind of fundamental here. There's a lot of solar contractors listening in and, you know, solar contractors, you sit down at the kitchen table or you know, however you're doing that now on Zoom, there's a COVID era, there's a lot of different ways people are doing it. But you sit down and you say, look, you don't want to pay your electric bill nearly as much as you are. It's really high. I want to save you a bunch of money on your electric bill. And your customers say, that sounds great. And then you do. And that's great. There's one person in the story who you can imagine is not happy with that. Uh, and that's the utility. And they are very unhappy. And so they see that their budgets are changing, that they, you know, the California has a, over a million solar customers. Over a million people in California have solar. Over 100,000 are getting solar every year. If you're the utilities, this is not an annoying thing. This is starting to become a bigger question. And so that's why they're pushing back a lot harder. And that's why they're basically saying everything they can. They're saying, you know, oh, solar is only for certain people or solar is only for you know, the, the people who work in solar, they have bad jobs. It's like, oh, you know, like, yeah, Aaron and Kate seem really miserable at their solar job. You know, it's like, they just really say whatever they can say. And a big part, um, you know, a nice thing about being in the industry is uh, we're right and we're generally popular and we have the people on our side. So what we have to do is actually show that, you know, we can't just say, oh, California is a bunch of greenies. It's so easy because, um, you know, there are alternatives to the state and we could talk about what these alternatives are, but there, there are corporate entities spending lots of money to get elected officials and regulators to believe certain things. And so what we have to do is show them the truth. We have to say like, hey, look, let's talk about happy solar contractors. Let's show people like solar contractors in Bakersfield and Fresno and Tulare and yeah, San Francisco uh, and LA and it's Chico. Let's go all over the state. Let's show people small, big, you know, they want, they say, oh, solar is just a big corporate entries like yeah there's big names that are publicly traded there's also two people in a truck and they're doing great too and there's people say oh well solar's qualities like here's people have been doing it for 40 years and they say oh well solar's what about solar unions like here's union solar shops here's worker-owned collective solar shops and here's 
people who hate worker on collective solar shops who are solar contractors. Like solar's everyone. Every if if you look at a map of solar installations in California or solar jobs in California, and it's a it's a population density map. And it's just solar is everyone, we are everyone. And so we have to show this to elected officials. And it's a big thing because like, you know, we're the kind of people who are going to be on a solar podcast on a Monday afternoon uh, and chatting with folks. And it's like really helpful to remind, you know, some of these regulators weren't around during the net metering to fight, but this is kind of all new to them. And if there is a corporate entity spending tens of millions of dollars and all these lobbyists to try to teach them one thing, it's like, it's on us to show it. And so, you know, if you're a solar contractor, if you're uh, work in the warehouse of a solar company. If you work in IT at a solar company, you're in HR. It is on you to let your elected officials know, the governor know, these regulators know that you exist. They have no idea. They're making rules that are going to dictate your life and your career, and they have no idea who you are. And so it's yeah, it's, it's on us. It's on you. It's on me. It's on all of us to have these conversations. Can we talk a little bit more about? what people can do you just said mm -hmm. reach out to your legislators are there are there more uh activities that that calisa is putting together to to help yes. people so there's a couple of things one at just like the base level is there's a petition at save california solar.org um that is the baseline petition saying hey we should Save California Solar .org. You know, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you should sign it. Your neighbor should sign it. Your coworker should sign it. Your dog walker should sign it. Your dog should not sign it. Every human that you know who's in California should sign it. We need to get tens of thousands of people to sign it. At the end of the year, we'll probably need to have gotten over 100,000 people to sign it. There are over 75,000 people who work in solar in California. Uh, so that should, in theory, that should be really easy to do it. But you know, as anyone who's done a product launch in this industry knows, uh, getting information to literally everyone in this industry takes a little bit of effort. And so step step one is sign, sign the petition. Step two is share it with absolutely everyone. The third thing is there's this group, it's the Solar Rights Alliance, uh, Solar Rights org is their website uh, big allies of ours we do we work really closely with them they are the voice of solar customers so there's 75,000 people who work in solar whose jobs would be threatened by the net metering decision made by the utility commission but there's also over a million people in California who's you know who made the right choice and who they want the next million to be able to do it and so if you're a solar contractor Getting the Solar Rights Alliance in front of your customers, sending out an email introducing them uh, is extremely helpful. So if you go to solarrights.org and say, hey, I'd love to introduce you to my customers, that's a really important voice to have on this. So this is a, a lot of information, a lot of really good information. We will definitely be keeping track of this story throughout the year. We will mm -hmm. check back in, find out more about what's going on. Yeah. Thanks for being here. I really Thank appreciate you. your time. And everyone go sign that petition and tell everyone. We can win this. We just all have to work at winning this. But we can definitely win this if we all do our part. Get awesome. out there and do it. Yeah, let's do it. Thanks, Carter. So everybody go out, sign that petition. Tell your friends to sign the petition. If you're in California, obviously don't do it if you're not. And yeah, share with your friends and family who are in the state. I can't. Uh, overstate how important state level solar associations are. I had the honor of serving on the board of COSA for many years, and I, it, it really is where the rubber meets the road as far as uh, solar policies go, is, is at the state level. Um, and, and so I do encourage everyone, if you're not in California, figure out where what your state level solar association is where you are and and please join these are critical critical organizations for our industry okay so we wanted to introduce a new segment yeah yeah i'm really excited about this let's uh let's talk about what happens actually in the field as pv systems are being installed and get some okay. stories shared yeah, that's that sounds fun. Um, so I I have a fun story that I'd love to share, and um, and then after well, after I tell the story, we'll give more information. But we want to hear from our listeners. Um, your fun stories from the field, fun, scary, exciting stories um, that you want to share with us. Um, but I'll go ahead and tell mine. Um, Let's take it off, Kate. Okay, so. It was the uh, spring of 2006, uh, Northern Arizona, and this is the, the days of 
really the wild west of solar. I mean, goop and a prayer, that's, that was a way of life. Um, we, were, we were drilling holes in module frames to attach ground lugs so that we could properly bond the system. It, it, it was a almost lawless time. <laughs> for, those of, for those who are not, uh, not watching the video, my face just went flush. <laughs> I used to work for solar panel manufacturers and, and that is, uh, that's not something that's in the install guide usually. <laughs> it's, it, it's not, it turns out. Um, but I was a, a brand new solar installer and I knew nothing about electricity. I, I joined this uh, solar installation company in Northern Arizona and um, I learned what my supervisors were teaching me and turns out they were figuring it out. It was a, an infant <laughs> industry at that time. It's, it's a young industry now. We, we were figuring it out as, as we went. So on, you know, the first week I'm learning how to lay out systems on roofs. I'm learning how to, to build uh, racks. I'm learning how to do some simple wiring. I, I wired some lightning arresters and I, I loved it. I loved all the things that I was learning. During my second week on the job, my supervisor, um, we'll call him Jake. That is not actually his name. Um, Fair. Fair. <laughs> he, uh, he came up to me and he said, hey, Kate, uh, we need to go to one of the jobs that we finished last week because we failed an inspection and I want you to come with me and we'll go fix it. Um, I said, great. So we got into the truck and on the way over, Jake explained to me what we're, what we're doing. And, and so what he told me was that the week before, while I was learning how to build racking, uh, inside of the, uh, the house, the decision was made that because the wire run from the attic to the inverter uh, was, was so complicated, it, there were a couple of different attics and it was just going to be a mess. So um, instead of running conduit and pulling wire, they decided that it was going to be a lot easier to just run Romex for the DC circuit. For those of you who might not understand what Romex is, I'll explain it. Um, it's basically a bundle of wires, three or four wires um, that are jacketed and, and you use them in residential construction for, uh, you know, wiring lights or, or outlets, that sort of thing. And it's convenient because you, you need three or four wires when you're doing the wiring and they're all together in a bundle in this one wire called Romex. So he explained that they had decided to um, to run Romex. Uh, they made the decision, I should note, without consulting the National Electrical Code. Um, luckily for everybody, the inspector did consult the code book and um, failed us because in the code it states that uh, you have to run a DC in a metal conduit. And so he's pointed that out. We went out to put add metal conduit to the situation. And, and so Jake explained to me, we're gonna just, we've got some metal flex in the back. We're just gonna slide it over the, the Romex and, and it'll be done. It's gonna be a really easy, straightforward kind of job. And I said, great. And so we got up to the attic and uh, Jake, you know, identified the spot where um, it would make the most sense to uh, start adding this, this metal flex. And so he, pulls up the, the Romex and he holds it out in front of me and he said, okay, Kate, now when you cut this, this is, it's live and it's, it's hot. So, so it's going to spark a little. And, and so go ahead and cut it. And so I, I took out my diagonal cutters and I got right over the wire and I, I just, I just stopped and I said, Jake, you cut this. I'm not going to. And he said, okay. And so he got out his cutters and he, and he clipped it and boom. So a lot of you are gonna understand exactly what just happened, but for those of you who don't, um, I'll try to give a brief explanation. See, when you connect the positive and negative leads of a solar panel, you, you create what's called a short circuit. And, and when you do that, you get an, an arc. Uh, which is like a, a tiny electrical fire. And so when we cut this wire, we had not one, but seven, eight modules wired in series. And as I said at the beginning, when I was explaining Romex, they, these wires are all bundled together. And so the positive and the negative from this string of modules is close enough together to create the electrical arc. And it made a big boom. And then we looked down and 
Jake was holding the equivalent of a welding torch in his hand. It was just this constant arc that we couldn't get to go out. And as we watched, the, it got closer and closer to his hand as it ate through the material that it was burning. And he, he looked at me and he said, what do we do? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, what do we do? And he said, I don't know, what do we do? And he took a deep breath and he collected himself. And then he explained that we were close to a junction box, a gutter box that had some lightning arresters in it. He said, just open up that box and just start cutting wires until this thing stops. And so I did, I, I opened the box and it was this nest of wires and try, I couldn't figure out what was what, but I just started clipping wires and eventually he said, it's out. And so I could stop and everyone was okay. The house was okay. We learned a lot that day. <laughs> we learned why you don't uh, run DC in, in Romax. <laughs> we learned that you should always consult your, uh, the code book before you do things that you haven't done before <laughs> that are out of the ordinary. Um, and I learned that, you know, sometimes supervisors don't know everything. <laughs> I'm really glad you uh, you didn't cut that wire, Kate. <laughs> his 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 dikes, his diagonal cutters, they were no longer usable. They it, it took a big old chunk out of his his tool there. Wow, Kate, I am very happy that you and nobody else was hurt during uh, during during that that. Uh... What, what's it called? A learning opportunity? <laughs> For our listeners out there who have stories like Kate's, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can submit your stories to us using the Solar Tech Talk page. We'll add a link in the show notes so that everyone can find that easily. We'll go ahead and pick one each time we record an episode, uh, or maybe a couple if they're shorter. Give us your good, your great, your terrible install stories. And please remember, no company names and try not to swear. We're trying to trying to engage in a family-friendly podcast. We look forward to hearing from all of you. Well, I think that's a wrap. This was a great show. You know, I know I learned a lot. I hope everyone listening and watching learned a lot as well. And we'll be back next month with another episode. Look forward to seeing and speaking with you all then.